If you ever have a problem with your RV's coax system and you take it to the dealer, they'll probably just slap a meter on like this, just an ohmmeter to check the continuity. Okay, well that will help you if you have a short, you know, say put a staple through the coax. This isn't really going to help determine what's wrong with the cable. And really using an ohmmeter to measure the quality of a coax cable is not much better than using an ohmmeter to measure the quality of a stick. It just isn't going to happen. And if the dealer is really good, they might even have an uh, upgraded test set like this. And this will help you find a short or an open, but not much else. Well, if you've got bends that are too sharp, loose cable connection, or if you have two or three barrel connectors, you know, these things aren't going to tell you what's wrong. So there's got to be a better way to determine your cable's integrity. And fortunately, there is. Time domain reflectometry, that sure seems like a fancy word. Well, in a nutshell, you can kind of think of it as radar for a cable. We basically transmit a pulse, like a radar, and that pulse travels down the cable, and any time it sees any imperfections in the cable, part or all of that energy is reflected back to the source. So over time, we can look at any reflections. And we wouldn't be rv-project.com if we didn't build something when we're done with the discussion. So yes, we're going to build a TDR. But first, let's continue with the TDR discussion so that I can convince you of why you might want to build one. So let's look at the next step. We actually are looking at amplitude, which is this line, versus time, which is this line. The transmitted pulse occurs here. And over time, the pulse travels down the length of the cable. And let's presume that when it gets to this point, it finds the end of the cable. It's going to reflect almost all of the energy back to the source here. And then we see on the oscilloscope the return pulse. So the distance between the transmitted pulse and the return pulse is actually the length of the cable times 2 because this has to be a round trip. So the pulse goes down, then it gets reflected back to the source, and that is represented by the longer distance here. Now if we short the end of the cable, put a paper clip between the center pin and the shield, then we're going to see actually a dip. And what we're really measuring on this line is the impedance of the cable, the 75 ohm characteristic impedance of the coax cable. And you remember before when we had an open, we had a positive going pulse, and that represents a high impedance or high ohm value. And when we short the cable, we have a low impedance because it's essentially ground. So a negative pulse is a short or low impedance. A positive pulse is a open. And if we put a 75 ohm terminator on the end of the cable, then we should not see any reflection at all. This line should go on forever which means that all of the energy is being transmitted and no energy is being reflected back. That tells us this would be a perfect cable. I suppose though in some respects reading a TDR is kind of like reading an electrocardiogram. You have to know how to interpret what you're seeing. And also sometimes introducing an error can be useful as well. In this graph we have an open at the end of the cable. So we just have basically a cable connected on one end to the TDR and then just left open on the other end. And since with an open as this, almost all of the energy is reflected back to the transmitter, we can approximate the attenuation along the cable by comparing the height of the peak here versus the height of the peak here and divide by two. Because remember, this is a round trip. You know, that looks like maybe about 40% attenuation total. So divide that by 2. So we got a 20% loss. A time domain reflectometer such as this Tektronix 1502 is going to set you back several thousand dollars. This particular one though is 1970s technology. So TDR has been around a long, long time. And in fact, this is the one I used back in the day. However, when I did some research on the internet, I ran across this page by Tommy Engdahl, and he's an amateur radio operator, and he actually designed a simple TDR. And I realize this project is not for everybody, and if you just want to read up on how a TDR works, this is an excellent document for that. 
But I contacted him and he gave me his blessing for me to make this circuit available to RVers on a non-profit basis. Which means if you own a RV, you can build a circuit. If you're a dealer or a manufacturer, go out and buy a commercial one because you're not authorized to build a circuit according to him. This is the one we used and it's a simple circuit, goes through all kinds of theory and you may not understand everything but you know still uh, you should be able to understand a lot of it and he has even a prototype of what he built along with some screens and also I found online at OSH Park where I have all my circuit boards made somebody uploaded Tommy Engdahl's design as a circuit board so when I discussed this with Tommy, he was not aware of this, so somebody had uploaded this without his knowing about it. Anyway, I bought this, uh, $14 for three of them, and this is what I'm using for the basis of the prototype TDR. And it is actually a bit refreshing that with this project, I've not had to design everything from scratch. I'm basically using designs that others have used and found that worked, and this is my website, and like many of my projects, I go into much more detailed information than what I do on the video. And you can see here, you know, these are some of the screens that you've seen on the video. And we also have bill materials for the parts, and some information on how to hook everything up, and how to interpret some of the results. So use this website in conjunction with the video. So you're going to have basically three expenses here. And the most significant one is the oscilloscope. And I recommend a 50 megahertz digital scope. And mine was about 350. And this is actually a predecessor to mine and they have it on clearance for 260. But you can go to eBay and find an older analog scope for 50 bucks or 100 bucks. Just make sure that the seller guarantees that it's working. And then of course you gotta have a power supply and I just have a inexpensive bench supply. It's $35 maybe. And the cost of building the circuit board for the TDR was about $25. If you're an electrical engineer or an electronic technician or even a maker these days, you may actually have a scope. So again, it's not for everybody, but a lot of people have the wherewithal to do this. And here we have the completed TDR after I soldered the components on a circuit board. And it's a bit crude, but it's going to work. And I have my Rigol DS1054 oscilloscope connected to the TDR board here and a cable that we're going to test and the power supply and my two scope probes. I also have the TDR set for five nanoseconds for short cables. And this is a scope screenshot of the actual TDR in operation. The blue line at the top you can disregard because it's a trigger signal. We're only interested in the yellow line at the bottom which is the actual TDR trace. And you can see the initial spike, and a short time later you can see the open reflection spike. And the two or three smaller reflections to the right of the open spike are ringing, and we can pretty much disregard that. And when we short the cable, we can see the spike go to the negative, so that confirms that's the end of the cable. And if we were to alternately open and short the end of the cable, then we could see the spike go positive or negative, kind of like a wigwag. And unfortunately, I could not do any video of the screen because there's too much RFI and I was getting audio and video interference on the camera. And finally, this cable is terminated with a 75 ohm resistor and we see a fairly flat response. So this is a pretty good cable. Now this cable is 50 feet and I'm going to use it as a feeder cable to connect to the other cables under test. This is required because there's not a lot of resolution in the TDR. And there's also a dead zone immediately after the transmit spike. So if we take a known good cable and use it as a feeder cable, any problems that the test cable may have at the beginning will not be masked over by the dead zone. Actually, the whole reason behind doing this project is because my satellite feed in my RV, the coax cable that provides it, was bad. If I use the RV's coax cable, I get no signal or a very poor signal. But if I bypass that coax by running another coax straight out a window to the antenna, I'd get a great signal. 
And here is a TDR of the actual coax in my RV. It looks terrible. I see two or three spikes between the open and the transmit spike, which is either a open in the cable or a bad connector or a loose connector or a pinched wire. Something is bad with that cable. When I started looking at the old coax, I immediately saw some problems. This is one of the barrel connectors in the wall plate, and you can see just after a few insertions that the insulator can no longer keep the center connector in the center of the cable, which of course changes the impedance. Further, I found three different barrel connectors in the coax line, so I replaced all the barrel connectors with higher grade 1 GHz certified connectors. You know, the ones with the blue barrel that everybody says aren't effective? Well, I think they are because after I tightened them, this is the result. Doesn't that look a whole lot better? Remember, this is the original satellite cable that was so terrible looking in the beginning. Now it looks almost perfect. Maybe about a 30% loss in attenuation, but that's okay. And just when I thought I had everything fixed, I do something stupid like open the slide out room. Now this coax cable goes from the main section of the RV into the slide out. So every time the slide out moves in and out, then the cable flexes. And as you can see from this graph, there is an extra blip just to the left of the blip showing the open. It's not there if the slide out is in, only when the slide out is out. So that tells me that flexing the cable with the slide out is putting stress on it and it's only going to get worse in time. Eventually it'll probably fail. So guess what? I'm going to replace the satellite coax cable with a shorter run that begins and ends in a slide out with an output on the outside of the RV. That way I have to not worry about the slide out damaging the cable over time. That also means that RV manufacturers that run coax cable, especially for satellite, through a slide out, they should be using something like Belden 1694F. This is a super flexible cable and it's typically found in TV production vans and such that, you know, are mobile and they have to reel up the cable and play the cable out on a mobile situation. But two to three dollars a foot, well, I wouldn't look for an RV company to start putting this in. Plus, it requires a more specialized connector because the center conductor is stranded and of course stranding is what makes the cable more flexible. So what have we learned from all of this? Well, firstly, if a manufacturer or dealer do not have a TDR at their disposal, they're not really sure how good the cable is. But as a RVer with just a few dollars, you can build your own TDR. And we see that the TDR has much more flexibility and my gosh, we saw a change in the characteristics of a cable just from the operation of a slide-out room. So honestly, is an ohmmeter going to tell you that?